you, everyone. Really excited to be here. And thank you for that awesome intro. Um, Clara, that was a hard act to follow. There's no ethics in this, <laughs> even a little bit. So it's very lighthearted, but hopefully that's OK. Um, so I see my coworker right there. Very exciting. Um, I work at Credit Karma, but since Moving to San Francisco, I've had a bunch of different jobs. I've jumped around a fair amount. So I started out as a communication designer, and then I moved into product design, and then finally I was a front-end developer. And each time that I changed jobs, I was like super excited to learn all of these new skills, but I never quite felt like I was solving the problems that I was interested in. So one sec. Cool, we're good. So fortunately, all of these early roles turned out to be excellent training for the job that I have now, which is being a design systems er at Credit Karma, building a design system from scratch. Does anyone else do design systems? It's kind of trendy. Cool, awesome. Um, though, if we're being honest, creating a design system from scratch looks a lot more like this. But that's a topic for another day. Um, so Credit Karma, it's a financial services company working to make financial progress possible for everyone. So in addition to providing free credit reports, you can also learn more about your credit factors. You can file your taxes for free. You can search state databases for unclaimed money. You can monitor your identity on the dark web. That launched recently. I highly encourage you to check it out if you haven't, because it'll tell you all your passwords that you should change. It's awesome. Um, and then, of course, helping people shop for financial products like credit cards, loans, car loans, insurance, and mortgages. Um, basically, the company makes money if you get approved for an offer that we recommend. So everyone wins, we hope. Um, the coolest part for me as someone who's worked at much smaller companies is that we have 75 million members. Um, this number still kind of blows my mind, but helping 75 million people navigate the complicated financial systems of the US and Canada is a huge, tremendous opportunity that we're all thankful to be working on. But when it comes to a design system, we are literally starting at square one. So when I started in August, we had about 10 designers and 30 PMs. <laughs> I know. Uh, two UX writers and a few hundred engineers. It was rough. Um, Credit Karma is 11 years old, and over the last few years, the design org has been transitioning from a service org to really a product-driven, product-led org, which is awesome. Um, and they were super excited to be clearing their schedules from all of these requests to really focus on solving member problems, which was awesome. So my pr top priority was basically to free up their time to have the space to think about their top priorities, which was always the member experience and almost never about the actual pixels or UI. Um, but since there are so many definitions floating around for design systems, I wanted to start with the one that we use just to, just to set the expectation. So if you're interested in design systems, I highly recommend that you read the book called Design Systems by Ala Kamatova. She's a really awesome designer living in London. And she design, defines design systems as a set of connected patterns and shared practices coherently organized to serve the purposes of a digital product. Um, a little jargony, but I promise it's a great definition. Um, and so connected patterns is something that I think we all hear about a lot working in tech design in the Bay Area. Um, and there's a lot of names for this part of a design system. So style guide, pattern library, UI elements, React components, sketch symbols. At Credit Karma, our design system is called Thread. And each sketch symbol that you see here has a React component counterpart on our documentation site. But I feel like we could be doing more to talk about the shared practices aspect 
that Ala talked about in her definition, because um, I personally find that a lot more interesting. So she goes on to say that shared practices are how we choose to create, capture, share, and use those patterns. And this is awesome because it's talking about the user experience of the design system itself, which I think is fascinating. So once you have those patterns and components and symbols and elements, or whatever it is, how do you actually share them and use them? Which brought me to another more important question, which is, should designers code? I'm totally kidding. I actually don't care about this question at all. <laughs> but as someone who's moved from communication design to product design to front end development, I find it really confusing that this question has inspired so much debate. To me, the answer is so clearly, it depends. Like, it depends on the organization, the ratio of designers to engineers, the strengths of those teams, what the individual team members are interested in learning about and growing in. But a better and more universally applicable question, in my mind, is should designers adapt best practices from related disciplines that have solved problems that design organizations traditionally struggle with? It's not as sexy, I admit it, but on the whole, I'd love to see more discussion around how we can share best practices across disciplines. For me, another way to ask this question would be, what can design organizations learn from their counterparts in engineering? So to me, one of the most fascinating things about engineering is that collaboration on the whole is non-optional. So especially as someone who's new to the field, um, you, can't, you can't write code that isn't going to play nicely with other people's code at your company. If you have 400 engineers writing code for a product, each person's contributions have to work with everyone else, and engineering orgs go to great lengths to ensure that there are as few snags when combining code as possible. Design teams, though, they aren't explicitly rewarded for reusing designs the way that engineers know that they should write dry code. So introducing inconsistencies can sometimes feel like productivity. But in most engineering organizations, you spend your whole first day setting up your development environment so that you can write code and ship it to production. So again, just to get on the same page about definitions, I'm here defining a development environment as the set of processes and programming tools used to create the program or software product. No one really likes setting it up. It's super tedious, but it's like this non-optional thing that you get through to make meaningful contributions to production, which is, of course, the goal of most of us here today, I would guess. For what it's worth, the dev environment setup instructions at Credit Karma have 24 subsections. Not even steps, just sections. Um, but it got me thinking, as the um, first designer at Credit Karma who's also contributing code, what if we want to make it easier for designers to design for production? What would that look like for us? So here I propose to you the definition of a design environment, the set of processes and design tools used to design the program or software product. Could we formalize the list of things that a designer has to have on their computer to easily design high quality products that are ready for production? So to get started, I came up with a list. To properly design for production at Credit Karma, a designer would need access to the thread, sketch, library, and symbols. Again, thread is just the name for our internal design system. Um, the color palette that matches our CSS variables. Have the correct font installed. I cannot tell you how much back and forth I have had with this font designer. He's very talented, but he lives in Switzerland, so it's like a whole time zone, and we had the font fixed, and just making sure that people actually had the right one installed was harder than you would think. 
typography styles that match our CSS classes for type, border and background styles that match our CSS classes, and sketch symbols that behave as closely to the Rayout components as possible. This is particularly in regards to spacing and typography. So once I had the list, it was a lot easier to start looking for solutions. So I put together a proposal for a few options that I thought would help. First one was abstract for version control and library distribution. The second one would be a sketch palette plugin that people could just load in once, not have to worry about it. Had to come up with a way for people to test that they had the right font installed and then have access to the correct font easily on Google Drive. Um, a sketch plugin to sync type styles from the thread library file, sketch plugin to sync layer styles from the thread library file. There's actually a win-win one plugin that does both, so that's great. Um, and then sketch plugins for padding and spacing at Credit Karma, we use Dynamic Button and Anima. The next step was gathering together a group of people to give it a step-by-step run-through. So here we have my calendar invite, February 8th. And uh, for this step, I thought it was really important to only involve people who volunteered to be part of this experiment, because I knew it was going to be kind of tedious. And so I had six design volunteers. That grew into a group of 10. And then by the time the meeting actually rolled around, it was like 12 people sitting in this very small area of the office. Um, I made a quick presentation to kind of walk through why we were there and what I meant by a design environment and how it would be helpful and then paused after each step to make sure everyone's setup was working. So that was a bad idea because the group was way too big and people got distracted super easily if their thing was fine for step one but not for step two, um, and lose focus, all that kind of stuff. But I wrote down all the bumps and where people got into trouble and I turned that slide deck into an article on our documentation site. So while putting things together for the documentation site, I was able to make a few user experience improvements of this process. So the first one was framing the setup as a time investment, basically telling the design team that this is time that you're going to spend now so that you have less time arguing with your engineers because what you design is going to be closer to what they actually have on their end. Um, the second one was pretty simple, time expectation. It's like a really long document if you were to actually scroll through it, but I put a little sentence, it's like, hey, this is only gonna take you 30 minutes, don't worry about it. Um, the third one was creating a Go link for all of the resources, so if you go to go slash design environment at Credit Karma or any other short linking tool that you might have, um, there's a folder with the plugins, the font files, the sketch palette file, um, and a couple of other things just to make it really easy for people to find. And then I also included a bunch of little extra recommendations like setting the sketch nudging to eight pixels instead of 10 because all of our padding classes are in units of eight, so just a little thing to make things easier. So uh, once it was published, I set up a video chat with one of our remote designers in LA. His name is Pedro and he's awesome. And um, I asked him to just run through the instructions while I was watching him, which felt really creepy, but he was down. And so I just, <laughs> I uh, took notes again as he was going through it and saw where he got stuck and did a few more iterations around the language just to make it really clear uh, what the steps were. But of course, we're designers and we always want to be data oriented. So what were the results of all of these things? Um, the thread team is myself and a friend and engineer named Tim. Tim is great also. And in Q2, we sent a survey to all the designers and engineers. So I'm only going to show the design results because this is about the design environment. But the engineering results were really interesting too. So one of the metrics we track for Thread is whether or not designers feel that it's easier to collaborate with engineering than it was three months ago, which was pre-Thread. And while the design environment is not entirely to thank for this response, I like to think that being able to know and be confident that the fonts and colors and padding and spacing and borders that you're giving the engineers are going to translate accurately on the front end. And I'd like to think that that helps the designer-engineer relationship. 
We also want to know if it's easier, if they feel like it's easier for them to design UI than it was three months ago. And again, there are only eight designers on the team by the time we sent this, so not including me, um, and not including any of the directors or VPs. But uh, so it's a small sample size, but it's nice to see that everyone saw an improvement. Uh, so some of the reasons include everything is there, my designs look consistent, the symbol library makes it faster, components, 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 helps quite a bit, thanks to whoever wrote that. Um, and one of my coworkers even said we have this uh, HR tool called 15.5 where you can basically give people high fives. So I got a high five from my coworker Allison and she said high five to Jules Forrest for making she's setting up new sketch files a cheap thrill with add slash abstract slash all the plugins, which I think is pretty much the best compliment you can ask for when requiring someone to take time out of their day to install tooling and software. But of course, as with anything, there are trade-offs. So I wanted to talk about those. Um, one of the biggest changes for our team in this process was taking away, taking a group stance on how our files should be managed. Um, and for the most part, everyone on, was on board, but it is an adjustment to say, no, you actually can't do it that way because we don't want to as a group. The second thing was creating additional dependencies. So the team decided they wanted to start using Abstract, which is a version control tool for Sketch. Um, but it's another account and service that they have to keep track of and log in and manage, and it's now a tool that the product managers and engineers have to log in and also manage, which has been fine, again, but it is a consideration whether your team has tool fatigue. The third, as with any additional dependency, is that with additional dependencies in the mix, there is an increase in software conflicts every time any piece of your tool chain updates. Again, it hasn't been too big of a problem, but you know, the day Sketch 49 came out, nobody was happy. Yeah. We got through it, though. Um, and then there's a little bit of mental overhead with too many tools or plugins. People have to remember shortcuts and commands and behaviors and why is this doing this here but not there. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about evaluating tools. So how do you know if something is worth adding or not? And I think there's basically three things that you have to think about, which is what are you getting out of it? Equally important, what are you giving up? And then is that trade-off worth it? Why and why not? Because you're gonna have people on your team who are gonna be super passionate about all the hot tools, and some people who are gonna be really against it, and then some people who aren't gonna care. And to convince anyone of a change that you think they should make, you're gonna have to tell them that you thought about all of the options. So abstract was a good example of this for us. Um, as a team, we were struggling to effectively track and share and collaborate on our work at scale. And we wanted the context that goes along with committing and versioning your work, which is, of course, Abstract's main selling point. But we we're giving up a pretty significant amount of workflow autonomy as a team, but it was so worth it for the amount that we're getting out of it. It continues to surprise us with its usefulness, particularly when handing designs off to engineering. But basically what I think it comes down to is this. Given the current design tool landscape, how can we design products in a way that most closely reflects how they will be built? And what's the smallest possible gap we can provide given our resources between designers and engineers? So the thread team, as I said, is two people. We don't have the resources to invest in like custom sketch plugins or custom anything plugins or any of this other stuff that some larger teams might have. So I chose the fewest number of plugins and steps possible to create the smallest gap that I could between what a designer sees in sketch and what they can expect to see on screen when they are collaborating with their engineers. And starting out, it was a really important step to just remind everyone on the team that Sketch can only create a close approximation of what you would expect to see in production. Um, it's not a browser, so there's always going to be discrepancies between Sketch's rendering and product production rendering, particularly with regards to spacing, color, and typography. So 
the takeaway there is just any final pixel pushing should always happen sitting next to your engineer. But I did want to pause for a quick note on design tools. The nice thing about design tools collectively converging is that all the tools individually get better. So nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, um, design tools won't make you a better designer. They'll just make some stuff easier and some stuff harder. But in digital product design, there's never been more tools to choose from and more hype about the pros and cons of each option. So we have Photoshop and Sketch and Figma. Now we have InVision Studio and Adobe XD. You can even do full-fledged designs and prototyping tools like Framer. But when Figma got prototyping, Sketch followed suit. When Abstract introduced version control for Sketch, Figma introduced version history with comments. And some companies like Airbnb or Facebook are even building entire tools on top of these platforms, or in Airbnb's case, building their own tool. So my only advice to you is to consider the process holistically and choose tools that bend to the way that you want to work and not the other way around. I think the overall goal of my goal as the thread team is uh, the easiest way to design UI should also be the highest quality. And by introducing a design environment to the team, I have gotten one step closer to that goal. So I just wanted to leave it with a question to all of you. What can we as designers learn from our cross-functional partners? So not only is this design environment process a work in progress, for sure, it's also just the beginning. So what would it look like if we had design linter extensions that would complain if you used values that weren't present in the CSS? Or pull requests for design so that it became everyone's responsibility to maintain system level consistency? or even open source design patterns that you can install on NPM. Even stuff like learning from the fields of, growing fields like product writing or user research. So I'm really excited to see what happens in this space over the next few years. Thank you.